other. Hello, adventurers, and welcome back for season six. Thanks to our patrons Brian Donnelly, Daniel Nichols, Brian Dowling, Haley Munoz, and Jolene Fresquez, along with many others in our show notes. We start this season by following Cordelia into the desolate but magical desert of Chikara. Far to the west of the Obsidian Fortress, from which she had escaped last season. Alone, and only the clothes on her back, our young fire mage seeks out a way to save her world from destruction. But little does she know what lies in wait for her. Dawn of Dragons. Season 6, Episode 1, The Torchbearer. Worse than back home. I mean, the desert. There's sand. Not this parched, cracked earth. Like a. Like a dried up riverbed. Just stretching as. As long as I can see. When was the last time water existed here? <laughs> How long have I been here? How long has it been? Days? Weeks? I lost count of how many times I've fallen asleep now. Just put one... One foot in front of the other. One foot. One dusty foot. Under my... Ugh. Poor tattered skirt. This one's white, you know? Not this beige, stained mess. The hem streaming with threads dancing in the breeze. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dancing. I remember dancing. Remember Baron. Fenrir's ball. I can hear the soft strings and flutes as we all smiled in the torchlit room. <laughs> Zane and Sophie never stopped dancing. They were spying, they said, but. <laughs> Benedict looks so upset and, and nothing for his diet. All rich, lavish desserts. Even the savory choices were <sighs> decadent. <laughs> Even a glass of milk. Cold glass of milk. <sighs> Burns my cheeks through the torn muslin they've draped over my face. 
from my sleeves. The dust and sparse dry grass. Kick my nose, making the air itself a furnace across my dry sinuses. Ugh. I need to take my mind off of that. Something that smells of anything other than the iron of dried blood. Pastries. Sweet and savory pastries. Venison. Like the Scott Mayor introduced to me in Ellington. Oh, God, delicious. <clears throat> That was... That was when Elaviv and Keldor saved the girl who was still in that bread. <laughs> Can't blame her, though. She was probably more hungry than I am right now. Oh, it's been so long since I had bread. So soft in the middle, but crusty. Like... This ground I'm walking on. Hot. Hot like and rook, but not muggy and thick. There's no lava and though the clear sky here is hot, it's not like that blanket of dark clouds with bright crimson edges. Like the lava itself. The lava we ran from when Arya and Chaco saved us and trapped that great red dragon fury behind us. Arya is a dragon too. And I knew that I could just tell by looking in his eyes the magic he knew. Nothing he gave me. I can't work the messaging spell he showed me anymore. Needs a gift from him or someone, and I have nothing. Just these clothes. The staff I found in the Nether Spring are all I was able to find in my escape, but. Wait. It's. Pretty powerful. And I've survived. I I shouldn't be so down on myself. I'm a strong, smart woman. I can make my own way. With just me. Just me. We've always been together. I don't want to be alone. The sun continued to assault the dry cracked earth of eastern Chikara, the desolate and ancient land where forgotten magical battles were fought. The wind slowly whipped dust into the raven black hair of Cordelia, the fire mage and librarian of the ivory library. Last in her memory, she was also a prisoner of the obsidian fortress setting in stone a strange dual citizenship between what she viewed as the forces of light and of night. At least, in some way, she found it interesting as the sun faded on her face. <laughs> I can see Zane and, and Scotty laughing as they hugged each other. <sighs> After being alone... Wait, I mean... Sophie, no, that was Zane, too. <laughs> They're the same. And Sophie never, never wanted to be alone again, either. <sighs> I hope she, she's okay. I hope they got away from Dachyon. Oh, God, it's so hot. Hot, like, this. Hey, this rock. I'll just sit. I'll just sit just for a moment, and, and rest here, just, just 
for one moment. <sighs> so tired. So... Oh, there you are. I, I've got you, Cordelia. Oh. oh. felt the heat fade. So this is what it is like to die, she thought. She felt herself lift from the dry cracked earth, borne on soft winds. A wash of something soft, cold and damp, struck her burning forehead as she fell tumbling, unable to stop, into her dreams. Little did she know that it was the shadow of another person that softly covered her face, that gently wiped her brow with a damp rag for a moment before scooping her up fluidly and burying her away like a gentle tide. Feels like a hundred. Uh, what? A bandage. A, a bed. But. Wait, where am I? Hello, my friend. How have you been? <laughs> oh, still sleepy. Rue? Ow. I. Um. Oh, whoa, 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 there. Take it easy. Here, just sit back a bit. Let me get you some soup. Last thing I want is you dying from starvation in my mother's house. <laughs> she would probably come back to haunt me for sure then. How did you find me? Well, I was led to you by a strong call in the tide of magic, my friend. A voice that you will hear too. In time. Cordelia sat back on the soft mattress covered in smooth sheets, feeling the cool touch as she shifted to a new area that hadn't been warmed with her feverish, sleeping body. Bleary-eyed, she looked around the room. Rue, this is your mother's house? Are we? In Chikara? Yes. Or more specifically, the town of Zestareo. Wait, did you hear my mother's house? <laughs> I apologize. I, I meant to say your mother's house. Though Lorahana's house is a lot like the house I was raised in as well. What? Uh, Rue? You knew my mother? You <laughs> never said anything before. I suspected, but but it wasn't until after reviewing your telling that I was able to confirm it. <laughs> Laura's daughter. <laughs> you look stunningly like her, by the way. And you probably inherited her knack for <laughs> curious mischief, no doubt. <laughs> well, that tracks. <laughs> uh... Was she a librarian? Oh, yes. But more so, she was my friend. We grew up together here before she left, when we were very young. We both became librarians together. But she also joined up with the Knights of the Glen. 
seeking more adventure than just books, I guess. To me, knowledge was what fueled my curiosity. The room was sparsely adorned with faded pastel silks of repeating geometric patterns in dark inks hanging from hardened clay walls. Rue gently stirred the kettle hanging in a stone shelf which served as a stovetop of sorts. It was made of stones, about waist high, and covered in a thick metal top coated with burning coals. Using a tool shaped like a mason's trowel, he moved the coals that turned from black cherry into a golden hue, almost white, under the kettle and increasing the heat. Rue looked at his hands as he picked up the long wooden spoon again, moving a small potato to the side of those smoldering coals to steam gently under an overturned steel bowl. Mm. Can I ask you something? Oh, sure. What do you need? Your mother carried something very special to our temple. And I was wondering... Well, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. How familiar are you with the elements? You mean earth, air, fire, and water? They're also known as uh, the Hag or the Mother of the Gods, right? Ah, that's good, good, good. I see your time in the library did you well, I suppose. Was that from an old... Yes! Oh, uh, I'm sorry, just... I got a little excited. Uh, it was the old tome on the fourth floor pedestal. The one with the six-pointed star and the blue-black leather? Ah, excellent. So you learned about the beginning of all things in that tome, correct? Oh, yes. It spoke of the elements and their first children, the, uh, para... pala... <laughs> you had it! The para-elements. Yes, yes, they are like children in the way they act. Unpredictable and impulsive. Really, they are just the shared powers of the elements themselves when they combine. Though they never combine the opposing forces, do they? You mean like fire and water or earth and air? Yes. Rules, I was told. See, the elements are their own entities and, as you know, created the deities themselves and some semblance of order. Everything falls into these four powers, even the six magics. Yes, life and death, chaos and knowledge, creation and destruction, right? Right, well done, yes. But there are four primal powers outside the elements, four mysterious powers that are outside their laws. Dragon, Fay, Sun, and Moon. These powers are mysterious even to the dragons and Fay folk, who supposedly, and possibly accidentally, created their own magic. The Sun and Moon, however, are more ancient than even the elements could claim to be, as they balance the cycle of day and night that affects us all. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry, Cordelia. I'm sure this is a lot to take in right now. And though this is a passionate subject and study of mine, maybe I should <laughs> get to the point. One moment. Ah, here we are. Some delicious chicken broth, if I do say so myself. And, uh, oh, ah, come here, my little friend. Ah, 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 a roasted blue potato from the garden. Oh, they are quite savory, you will find. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, ow. Uh, it really does look delicious. <laughs> yeah, drink that broth. 
Your head probably hurts from the dehydration still. And don't forget to drink your water here. Oh, yes, I will. Mm, thank you. It's wonderful. Uh, mm. So, I said there was something your mother had that was very special to our temple. Do you recall a tattoo of hers on her wrist? Like the spell book I see on your wrist. Ooh, very clever. Oh, was that? It was my mother's, too. I found it in the old nursery of uh, Garnet Keep. Ah, clever, clever, Laura. <laughs> she figured it out. The secret of the tattoos that we know is some sort of dragon or fey magic. Sure of it. But not sure how they came to be. You see, your book is definitely dragon magic. Uh, but do you mind if I take a closer look? Ha! Told you the soup is good. Okay, so... It's definitely set with the love and passion of dragon magic. No, not like this. Look. He rolled back a single deep blue sleeve revealing a black slender tattoo on his deep sepia wrist. It was shaped like a spear with an S-shaped line snaked around the length of it. She noted the slow pace of his pulse below the skin was as calm as his voice ever was. Rue's demeanor was always likened to a lighthouse in a raging storm, ever and always calm. She looked into her mentor's deep eyes for a moment catching a glimpse of the vast ages of wisdom behind those umber pools. They seemed to swirl like storm clouds over a derelict ship crashing into a rocky shore. Looking back at his wrist, she saw it glow slightly, but the pattern swirled and strobed erratically around the spear-like symbol, like a heartbeat, like it was living. Never seen that symbol before. Is that a rune of some sort? <laughs> oh, you haven't spent much time at sea, have you? Ha! Ah, watch. Standing up, he calmly touched the tattoo, responding like a crashing wave. A five foot pole appeared in his hand. It had a three foot iron spike on one end with a bladed tip bathed in a ghostly tide of blue light. A golden cord wrapped down the shaft, ending in a coil within one powerful hand. This is Typhoon, the harpoon of the water elements. I was chosen to carry this when I walked the ancient path in the temple of the elements, as did... My mother. Yes. Her tattoo was a flaming sword. Yes. It is called Torch and is the sister to Typhoon. But she's gone now. Rue dismissed the harpoon from his hand with a slight motion of the wrist before sitting down with a smile. She is, but I've been told Torch has returned to its resting place within the temple and is now calling out for a new partner. And it was that call that led me to you. Rue and Cordelia stood by two small boulders in an empty wooden room. The room was lit by thin fabric windows that diffused the light of hidden torches. This light danced off of five-foot poles gilded in brass and red jasper fixtures that held long scrolls on the walls. Periodically, these scrolls glowed with the ghostly image of a great warrior or a mage in some ancient scene. Though Cordelia was fascinated by them, her attention was demanded by her mentor, Rue. You must unlearn what you know. You must then learn to hone your body as well as your mind within your craft. The temple is dangerous 
and you will be greatly tested. Like the telling? No, that was just within your mind. This is within the very essence of the universe itself, including you. You must learn how to walk the four paths of the elements. Please stand on that stone, and I will stand on mine. Ah, there. Now repeat after me. The wind's parsi blows are in swamps with green foam. The wind's parsi blows are in swamps with green foam. Ningalix plots in seashells called home. Ningalix plots in seashells called home. The flames of Lanana warm up an ice throne. The flames of Lanana warm up an ice throne. While under the sand, Azalix lurks all alone. While under the sand, Azalix lurks all alone. Good. But what is Parsi or Azalix or any of this? What does it mean? In due time, Cordelia. We don't always know the answer, but we seek to understand the truth behind it, even when we don't know it. Cordelia looked away, slightly frustrated at what she thought was a non-answer to her question. From behind one of the scrolls, she thought she saw a pair of glowing yellow eyes. As if sensing her gaze, they quickly disappeared. Hey, Rue, did you see that? Rue, ignoring her distraction, threw a six-foot pole of polished hardwood at her. Catch! Whoa! Hi, guard! Yeah! Ah! Coming down hard, Rue swung his own staff downward in an arc, which Cordelia instinctively parried. Good. Now, again. Huh. So thus began my training. I worked toward rethinking the way I saw the world. Every breath I became more familiar with the elements in my mind and body, and not just through the weave of magic. I learned to strike with the staff and treat it as an extension of my body. My hands themselves became weapons, and I could resist heat and cold with them. Over the next few weeks, I was trained and tested, treated and reformed. And somewhere in the shadows of that room, I knew something was watching me as well. Appearing in this episode, Cordelia the Fire Mage, Jolene Fresquez, Rue the Librarian from the Ivory Library, David S. Deer from a Ninth World Journal podcast, Keldor the Narrator, Mike Atchley. All music in this episode is written and performed by Mike Atchley and is available wherever you stream your music. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Dice Tower Theater's Dawn of Dragons, Please join us in thanking our magnificent cast by leaving a review on your favorite podcasting platform. In our next episode, what has happened to Sophie and Scottmere on the other side of the world? Have they found the lost dwarves of Bloodwood? Stay tuned for when we return next month. Until then, adventurers, stay safe and remember the oath.